So the narrative of black people in the United States was, you know, you, you, you came from these, these primitive, savage people who had no history, and everything you are, we made you. Strip the African of his knowledge of himself. You can then replace that knowledge with any falsification of consciousness you desire. Once you take from me my knowledge of myself, you can then tell me those lies. Racism is what we are all living and breathing 24-7. There's never a moment, a second, a minute, an hour, a day, a year. For the past 500 years when race has not been the dominant reality. America has done all of these terrible things to black people and then they complain when we do it to ourselves. We're mirroring what they have always done to us since we got off those boats. It's easy to sit up somewhere and talk with black people about black people, but it's not so easy to have to sit up and look in white people's face and talk to them about white people. Now that's what I know. 43 million black people, I think that probably 10% of our community at this moment in time would have a real consciousness about their ancient and modern history, that 90% of us don't have a clue of who we really are. My mom used to say, you darker, work harder. That you, the darker you are, the harder you have to work, the smarter you have to be. Folks were breastfed on racism, breastfed on. If you're talking about a problem in the world and you're not dealing with white supremacy, you ain't talking about the problem. There's never been a real dialogue in America about race because whenever we start to talk about race, the conversation will venture into, well, what's wrong with black people? White people did whatever they wanted to do to black people. You know, so what are the rules? American people have been constantly looking for the rules in America. Our whole experience here, we want to know what are the rules to be accepted by the dominant society? What are the rules to not experience racism in America? And every time we learn one rule, we're told those rules don't apply and there's another rule. When African Americans were first dropped off on, from the slave ships, we said, okay, what do we need to do to be accepted by the dominant society? We were told, well, if you change your name from those African names, we'll accept you then. So African people said, okay, we'll change our names. Can we be accepted? They said, well, no, not quite, because now you're using that voodoo and that African religion. If you take on our religion, then we'll accept you. So black people said, well, that's not a problem. I mean, we're familiar with Christianity because we have a version of that in Africa. The whole European Jesus thing, that's a new thing for us. But if you'll accept us and you'll lay off the racism, no problem. We'll be better Christians than you. Can we be accepted? The dominant society said, well, no, not quite, because now that African voodoo is still there. So maybe if you weren't so lazy, we'll accept you. So black people said, OK, well, we're, we're slaves. Nobody works harder than a slave. We pick all this cotton. We do all this work. Nobody works harder than us. Can we be accepted? So the dominant society said, well, no, because now slavery is over and we don't need your work no more. So black people said, OK, well, how about hiring us since we have all the skills? The dominant society said, well, no, not quite, because we have white only unions, so we don't need that. So African-American people said, OK, well, look, how about we just build our own communities? We'll build our Tulsa, Oklahoma's, our Central Avenues in Los Angeles. We'll build our own prosperous communities, and we'll just leave you be. How about that? The dominant society said, well, no, you can't do that because now you're making a little more money than us and now you're becoming a threat, so we're going to burn those little communities down. So black people said, OK, how about this? We'll work for you. Just hire us. We'll keep our heads up. We'll have dignity. Will you accept us? The dominant society said, well, no, because you're being uppity now. We don't want uppity black folks. So black people said, OK, well, how about this? We'll just shuck and jive. We'll be entertainment for you. We'll tap dance, skin and grin, coon, do whatever. Can we be accepted? The dominant society said, well, we love the entertainment part of you, but we can't really respect that, so we won't accept you. So black people said, well, we'll just drop out completely. We won't even try to be accepted by you. We'll just hang out on the corner. We won't even try to become part of the dominant society. We'll just hang out in front of the liquor store. If we see something we like, we'll take it. We'll just do our thing. The dominant society said, well, no, you do that, we're going to arrest you. So black people said, okay, well, 
How about we just go in the house? We'll just get crumbs from you. We'll just stay in the house and watch TV because that way we can escape racism. But the thing is, when you look at television, what do you see? Negative image, negative image, negative image, negative image of African-American people. So the bottom line is there are no rules for the dominant society to accept black people as a whole. All the rules are there to keep you marginalized. And that brings us to rule number one. Keep people confused as to what racism is. The first time I think I became aware of racism as a kid was um, watching cartoons. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, they have like, you know, cannibals cooking up people and the, the way the illustration was, you know what I'm saying? It was like, wow, like Africans don't look like that. Like, come on guys, I get you making a joke. It's fun to poke little fun jokes at people's different, different characteristics, you know, and point those out. But it went overboard when it came to Africans and, and cartoons. Because racism is not a noun, it's a verb, it's an action. And in order for a person to practice racism or to be a racist, they have to not just have prejudice, they have to have power to influence the success or failure of another group's life. That's a racist, and we don't understand it. We think it's just not liking somebody. Racism has to do with power. For example, a black person could stand on the corner and say every negative thing they could think of to say about a white person. They can't determine where the person lives, how much money the person is going to make, you know, whether they're going to have health care. So racism is a power dynamic. It is a power system dynamic. And black people are the victims of racism. Calling a person names is not the same as being able to control every aspect of that person's life. Racism means to control somebody's faith and destiny. I can hate you because you're Jewish, I can hate you because you're Irish, I can hate you because you're German. That's prejudice. America was founded on racism. There's no institution that can get away from the founding principles of its origin. America was founded on the oppression of African people, the enslavement of African people. In order for you to get away from that, you're going to have to reconstruct American society from the bottom up. Well, if you are struggling for your genetic survival, then the threat to your genetic survival has to become a target. And the black male is perceived as the threat to white genetic survival. It's because only males, whether they're white, black, brown, red, or yellow, can impose sexual intercourse. Females cannot impose sexual intercourse. So if the male and if the black male is perceived consciously and or subconsciously as the genetic threat, then he has to be attacked. And so this is what we see, whether it's unemployment, incarceration, failure in school, because there is war going on. The cloak of Obama, under the illusion of inclusion, as I like to call it, black people are suffering more now than they did under both George Bush and Bill Clinton. Our unemployment rate is higher our incarceration rate is higher. Every index of so-called progress for blacks is worse under Obama than the two, three previous presidents. You always put a black face in office when you're about to take things back from black people. Let's be clear, I'm not suggesting that black people don't hate white people. There are plenty of black people that go, I hate you. I hate you, I call your names, get pictures of white people, throw darts at them but you still get the loan. So the fact that black people don't like white people doesn't mean they have the power to affect them as an entire group. See, white ain't a color, it's an attitude. And you got to have big bucks to be an attitude. But here's what they didn't hide. They say, if you have 132nd Negro blood, you're a Negro. Now think about what they just told you. This is a cat who don't like me. He said, if you have one 
32nd Negro blood in you. You know what that really means? In order to equal one Dick Gregory, you got to put 32 white boys next to me. Are you crazy? Black people look at racism as a moral issue. And when you look at racism as a moral issue, especially for black people, you automatically relegate racism to the realm of religion. That's a problem. Because now the solution to racism becomes baptizing or Islamicizing white people uh, into of the righteousness of God and equality. And the problem with that is that the church and the mosque, ironically, have been some of the biggest perpetrators of history, uh, of racism in global history. The Roman Catholic Church was one of the first institutions to actually give permission, okay, for African people to quote unquote, be reduced to servitude. To get someone to actually think that someone else is inferior, you have to raise that type of mentality to a religious level. And that's why racism essentially was given its validation through the church. And it is the church that gave it a divine presence in order to say that whatever atrocities you commit in the name of the church is justified because these people did something against God that warrants their punishment and their social status. What makes it so hard to fight it is because it's invisible. When you go to court and you sue for discrimination, when you go to court and you sue for racial prejudice, I didn't get hired because I was black. I was kicked out of school because I was black. You have to prove racist intent on part of the perpetrator. So racism as white supremacy's chief weapon is difficult to combat it because you have to prove that the person who committed the act of racism had the deliberate intent of discriminating against you because of color. And because we are all humans, nobody's perfect. So there's a million reasons they can use as an excuse for why you didn't get hired. He didn't have enough experience, but you really didn't get hired because you were black. There's a million reasons they could use why you didn't get hired. He was overqualified. Now look at that. You talk about some re reverse racism. You told me I couldn't get the job because I didn't have a college degree. I came back with a master's. Now you're telling me I'm overqualified. So now before I didn't get the job because I didn't have enough education, now I don't get the job because I got too much. So the problem with racism is that it can hide behind everyday human errors that all of us have. Blacks was called Africans, whites was called Europeans. You know how many people don't know there was more white slaves in America than black slaves? They call them indentured servants, okay? So they came together one day and said, man, listen. And they overthrew the slave master in that whole area. So they said, wait a minute, let's think about this. Here's what we do. Let's call the Africans black folk and the Europeans white folk. That's where that came from. Nobody in the world referred to themselves as white folks. There were no people classified as white before the 15 and 1600s. As a matter of fact, the term Caucasian is a very relatively new term. It was a guy named um, Johann Blumenbach who came up with that term around 1790, 1795. So these are relatively new terms. Were there white people in antiquity? She asked that question. Were there white people? And certainly, um, people with lighter skin existed, but did they perceive themselves as white? No, for neither the idea of race or the whole idea of whiteness, it didn't exist. People weren't, in, there was no real uh, relevance given to that kind of idea. People were more interested in the regional stuff and where you, but there was no concept. Not until the construction of the um, mid 1800s notion of the Caucasian uh, you know, Carl von Linnaeus and Johann Friedrich Blumenbach who came up with this whole idea of this Aryan nation, just a whole basic fictitious hot mess, did the whole idea of race and whiteness even appear. But with the emergence of that construct of whiteness came the emergence of white supremacy.
To know your history is everything, no matter who you are, especially black, because you're constantly being told that you were nothing but a slave, constantly. No one began as a slave. That's not what God put you here for. If you know anything about the history of slavery, that's the first thing that they, they did. They beat your history and your native tongue out of you. And what's amazing about America, even the state of Texas, has the school board is now expunging slavery out of the books. So they won't have to be held accountable for what they did. It's going to be difficult for people to prove intellectual inferiority. That's why even in our textbooks in school, they don't like to teach our children about black inventions because even greater than our African history or our American inventions. Because from nowhere, you're coming up with things that revolutionize the American social and economic order. Well, basically, there is a proverb that says that the only thing that peoples of European descent ever created was the patent office, because they stole everybody else's ideas and put their name on it. During slavery, because you were the property of your master, a lot of what we invented was automatically given credit to the master. The credit was forwarded to the master because we was property. We weren't allowed to take fame or notoriety for the things we created. Anything that made work easier. Why would white people want to invent something that make work easier when they had black folks to do it? You have a huge incentive to try to get things uh, to move smoothly so that, you know, you don't get any more lashes. You know, or somebody doesn't now have to sell someone else in your family. You know, you know there, were a, there was a lot of incentive to create, uh, create inventions. And that's another thing. Most of our black inventors had to deal with idea theft. White folks would come in and say, we did it first because we didn't necessarily know the process or have the money to patent our inventions. So white folk will find out what a black person invented and go do it real fast and get their application in because back then the process wasn't as thorough as it is now. Whoever got their application in first to the patent office, that's who got the patent. So we got thousands of inventions by black people. We'll never even know it because of the fact that they were stolen. They don't want anyone to know that we invented things. If it, if it wasn't for black people, white people couldn't take a dump. A black man invented the toilet and he just made it white on purpose. A slave by the name of Black Sam, Eli Whitney Slave, created the idea for the cotton gin, and his master took it and patented in his own name. How could he do that with no benefit of books he wasn't even allowed to learn? A lot of people assume just because African slaves were illiterate, they were ignorant. And there's a real big difference because African people, they had a very elaborate language or, or elaborate languages over in Africa. When Africans were brought over here, they were taught a bastardized version of English and they weren't even allowed to see the, the language written down. And they were taught the language by lower class Europeans who were living in the South. So even though there was that major obstacle, blacks still did phenomenal things. Thomas Edison was known for stealing people's inventions. He was known for taking the inventions of a few African-American inventors. Um, Louis Latimer, um, Granville T. Woods actually went to court with Thomas Edison and Granville T. Woods actually won his case. Thomas Edison tried to bring Granville T. Woods to court on that invention. And I just saw a commercial for Mazda, I believe, cars, where they said, here's a man holding a thousand patents. Well, 90% of them he stole. Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison, who are probably considered America's two greatest inventors of all time. But guess who was designing their uh, blueprints for the patent application? A black man. Now let's think about this for a minute. If you invent something, why do you need me to do the blueprints for the patent application? If it's your idea, how in the hell can I do the blueprints for it? You can't do the blueprints for my idea. I have to do them. So if Latimer is doing the blueprints, if he is your chief draftsman and he's doing your blueprints for your patent application, Alexander Graham Bell, did you invent the telephone or did Louis Latimer invent the telephone? Thomas Edison had a whole troop of people that was in his sweatshop and depending on the invention, he would hand it over to that particular department and tell them, see what it is that that does and then do something a little different and we'll patent that. And when they took, when he took Granville T. Woods information and tried to make it his own, the court said no. 
The watermelon and black people stereotype, that came and that was popularized by Thomas Edison. Um, around 1890, Thomas Edison put together this Nickelodeon reel. And uh, there were these African-American men who were joking around, shucking and jiving, and, and kind of mugging for the camera. And they were eating watermelon. And Edison filmed this, put this out, and the general public saw this. And they said, OK, African-American people must really love watermelon. And right after that film came out, thousands of postcards and all types of memorabilia flooded the market of African-American people eating watermelon. So that watermelon stereotype was popularized by Thomas Edison. A lot of people don't know there's an African-American male who is significant, has patents on the first major computer chips that made computers operate. Other inventors that we don't know about, essentially, who they call the father of the internet, was Philip Imegwali, a Nigerian man who essentially created the connection for quantum bits of information so that multiple computers could actually communicate with one another. During slavery, and this is well documented by white people, many of the masters, when they were sick, did not call for the physician. They called for the big mama on the plantation, and she would come with her medicine bag that didn't have alcohol in rum. It had all types of things that she made from the herbs that she had planted. Some of them said, I don't want the doctor. Bring me the witch doctor, that voodoo woman who I own. Africans took what they brought from Africa, which would be a ground hockey, and all they did apply the game to ice. When the British were, were fighting the United States, there were African slaves or former slaves assisting the British in fighting the U.S. When the U.S. won and the Britons lost, many of the African Americans were sent to British colonies in West Africa, and many of the African Americans were sent into Nova Scotia, Canada. And they formed what we now know as hockey. They started to play this new game called hockey, which was something that Africans were doing in Africa. In ancient Kemet, there was a form of field hockey that they were playing. And they went into to Canada, and they created what we now know as hockey, and there were actually black Canadian hockey teams in the early sport of hockey that a lot of people don't know about. And there's a great book about that called Black Ice that talks about the early inventors of hockey who were men of African descent. The baddest cowboy, black or white, this man was so bad that they called him the invincible one. Just to say that there was nobody better than this man in the West. And that's been co-signed. The brother's name was Bass Reeves. Now, Bass Reeves was a former slave who pretty much beat up on his master to get away. When we think of runaway African slaves, we always think of the African sneaking away in the middle of the night, hiding, ducking and dodging behind trees, hiding in bushes, hiding in rivers. Bass Reeves decided he was not going to be a slave anymore. And not only was he not going to be a slave, he told his master, I'm going to beat you up before I leave. So he beat up his master, escaped and got away and went into Oklahoma, which was like an outlaw territory. So he actually got away and became very prominent in the Old West. When they began to open up the Oklahoma Territory, they needed to recruit people. And they recruited him because he knew the Creek language, uh, he knew the Muscogee, uh, he knew how to speak the Seminole language, he knew all of the natives of the, of the area, and he sat with them to learn about their traditions. The real life of this black man, Bass Reeves, became the mythic legends of Hollywood white cowboys. He brought in 3,000, count them, 3,000 bad guys. I'm talking about the worst murderers. He got 3,000 of them, killed 14. All of who the Lone Ranger became when you saw him on TV was actually the life of Bass Reeves. African people, in many ways, the Underground Railroad established African people moving west and establishing places to be able to protect them. And so in the study and the research of the Underground Railroad, you will find that there are African, African-American communities that were established and have been there from before people can actually talk about it historically. Many people don't realize that African-American people founded and settled many cities around the country. Um, Buffalo, New York was founded by a black man. They called him Black Joe Hodges. Um, Many African-American people had a less volatile relationship with the Native Americans. A lot of the European settlers, they were beefing with the Native Americans. 
So they couldn't go into certain areas in, peacefully. But a lot of African American settlers would go in there and they had somewhat of a camaraderie with the Native American people. In Los Angeles, 44 African American families came to Los Angeles and founded Los Angeles. Um, the governor of what was then known as Alta, California, which is now the state of California, the governor was a man of African descent named Pio Pico. And there's a street out here in Los Angeles called Pico Boulevard named after him. You had an African-American woman named Biddy Mason who was a very wealthy landowner in early Los Angeles. So African-American people were very prominent in founding many cities around America. Chicago was a city founded by Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, a, a brother of Haitian background coming up through and, and founding this city at Chicago, because that is what the indigenous people called it uh, in this part of Illinois. Now, Seneca Village really is a misnomer for, for Senegal Village. Seneca Village was a community in New York City that was uh, purchased by freed Africans. When the enslavement of African people was abolished in 1827, Senegal Village became a meeting place for African people in general. The backstory, it is believed that Senegal Village became part of the Underground Railroad for African peoples. Starting in 1855, you're going to have people start to call it a shanty town, where people who are squatters live. They're going to demean the importance of Senegal Village. You're going to say, you see, you see all these African people moving up in here, and they're squatters, they don't belong there, and we need to create a park. And so they begin to put themselves upon the people. Finally, the mayor signs an edict say, eminent domain, you gotta get out. And so by 1857, the last Africans were forcibly removed from their homes. What's interesting about Central Park, it was once an African-American community, Seneca Village. And now there's a, an ancient African monument. There's an obelisk in Central Park right now. That's from ancient Africa, from ancient Kemet. And a lot of people don't even realize it's there. A lot of people think that the enslavement of African people was only down south. That's not true. The largest plantation in the 13 colonies at one point in history was in Brooklyn, New York. And you know that area down there, down by Battery Park, where they, they used to bring the ships into that area, the port, and they would dock the ships and they would bring the Africans up out the ships and they would walk them across to be sold. However, what they did was, because they couldn't free uh, sell all of them, they used to put them in different prisons along this particular path. And then they would march the Africans that they were ready to sell down the street, down a street called Wall Street down into a place we today call the New York Stock Exchange. African people were the first stocks and bonds sold on the stock exchange. There's a movie by Bruce Willis that will show you the prisons that are underground, the stock exchange building. Wiley Jones was a former African-American slave who went into Arkansas. He stacked his money up and he became a railroad owner. He owned a railroad system and the city of Pine Bluff, Arkansas ended up buying his railroad system and that system is still owned by Pine Bluff right now. The Patterson Car Company was a car company founded by former slaves, African-American men, and the Patterson Car Company was the first African-American car manufacturer in the country, One of the, I think the only manufacturer in the country. And what's interesting about the Patterson Car Company, it was in Ohio, their cars were considered higher quality than the Model T cars that Henry Ford had. The Duray brothers, Ford and them stole it. That's why all over the world, Ford never gets credit for inventing a car. He gets credit for mass production. The cars began coming off the assembly line at the rate of one every 40 seconds. Until that, they take one car and put it together. One car and put it together. But where did he get that from? George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was never around black folks till he went to Tuskegee. The mother and father died or was killed. And a white family adopted him from Iowa. You know, black folks in Iowa, such football players. Hmm? So he went to grade school, high school, and they didn't have no secondary school. They didn't have enough people. Hmm? And so now George Washington Carver leaves after he gets all his education come out of there. He goes to Tuskegee. Henry Ford came down to visit like he always see his friend. 
And she said, Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, I got something here. Study plants. And see, if you take this back and give it to your engineers, they can build more than one car at a time. You took it back. Mass production all over the world is called the plant, right? Everybody made joke of him because they said, well, you know, but the plants are talking to him. You know, is, is this how he's getting these, these, these properties of these plants? And George Washington Carver, in his quiet, dignified way, said, well, who taught me? I'm not saying that they talk to me like they got a tongue, but I can look at a plant and see what it can do for the human family. The military came to George Washington Carver, and they said, we need you to do something for us. Can you invent something that out of it we can get paint, glue, ink, and plastic? The young man was, they tell me how smart black folk are. Young man was. So he came back, called soybean. Now you want to hear something funny? The number one cancer group in America, vegetarians. Because <laughs> you weren't supposed to eat soy. When he got to Tuskegee, they thought he was gay. No association with women, high pitched boys, they thought he was gay. The finest juice we've been able to make of peanuts is in the treatment of the after effects of infantile paralysis. And he's rather for you to believe he was gay than tell you that them white folks that adopted him castrated him so he couldn't have sex with their daughter. Like, who wanted them, huh? <laughs> Do you see King Kong? New York City, Empire State Building? That's about Jack Johnson and the white ladies. Why would the gorilla go to New York? They ain't got no bananas, and Lord, no ain't no trees. Why did they go there? The boxing capital of the world is Madison Square Garden. If you don't know how to break it down, you know. Johnson controlling the pace of the fight. And we have to understand that in our celebration of Jack Johnson and that one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano, man, this is you and me, and this is what we're going to deal with. There were lynchings the day after every fight. And that's very important to understand as it relates to the psychology. He used to love to drive. He used to love to speed. And he'd be speeding someplace, and the police would stop him. And because they saw that he was a person of African descent, because they saw the car that he was driving, some may have known who he was, but they said, well, what is this man got doing with this car? They would fine him. they say, OK, we're going to give you a ticket for speed. Here's $500 ticket. $500 for speeding back then? Story has it, he'd give him $1,000. He said, because I'm speeding back. <laughs> in the sport of boxing, there has always been a need for the great white hope in boxing. Um, since there could not be one in real life, Hollywood just created one, and that's what the Rocky movies were about. Uh, they were giving out the awards, and Rocky won, OK, to Oscar. And Muhammad Ali came out, and he was the one that gave Sylvester Stallone the award. But. <laughs> Can't you see I'm working? I'm the real Apollo, please. You stole my ship. And Ali, in his most powerful way, came out and said, you know that story was about me. He said, you know that was about me. You know that y'all dream about beating a black man. He said, and, but you know what? The only place you'll ever do it is in Hollywood. society that loves women. This is a society that loves motherhood. This is a society that loves babies. Just not black women, black motherhood, black babies. There is no more fierce warrior than a black woman. We just got the fierceness in the wrong direction, you know. We just got it all backwards. If we decided to stand up and stand up for you and say, no, you're not going to say that about him, or every time something said about him, we said, no, that's not true. That's the first thing I said on television. Oh, no, he's a good man. He's the best man there is. Well, that sound is not in the airways. Because ain't nobody saying that. You know, if we started taking that position, all things would change for you. The image of the black woman has consistently been complicated. So, you know, you get the mammy image, right? And that mammy image was one, you know, the kind of Aunt Jemima. Uh, the mammy image, coming from slave days, was one who was really good to massa. 
but knew how to control her own people, particularly knew how to control uh, the man in the slave community. Um, and, and so where she's like all huggy, snuggly with the white child and yes, whatever you need. When, it, when, it, when she was back in the slave cabin, she's dominating, domineering. You have the concept of the African woman as the Jezebel. She free with herself. And then you have the mammy complex, where you have the heaviest set woman. Neither one of them is wrong, neither one of them is bad. That might just be their attitude. But they could be good, solid people. But in order to assuage your conscience, in order to make you feel better about yourself as to why you raped her, or why you beat her, or why you treated her the way you do, you say, well, she ain't nothing anyway. So that's how I'm, I'm going to make myself feel better while I mistreat her. Their sex is um, promiscuous. Right? And how do you know? Well, this is literally out of a medical journal. Their protruding buttocks and genitals were offered as evidence of their pathology of lust. Because they had big butts. We accept you as you are exactly, and you are beautiful to us in that way. But we don't believe that because of outside interference. And so they've given us this artificiality as a, a concept of what beauty is. And so we want to have all these other things which are still mimicking white women. We have seen hot combs in Egypt. African women did use hot combs on their hair. But they did not have a woman of European descent who they were emulating to look like that. 6% of America's population, 98% of fibroids in America Black women, the next highest group, Jewish women, what they got in common? Nappy hair. How come my mother never heard of fibroids? How come they didn't get fibroids? You can't catch it, it ain't a disease. How are we getting it? Perms! When we start using perms, those chemicals go through my skull. Hmm? And that's how I get fibroids. Now, fortunately, there is a trend out there where black the sisters are coming back natural a little bit. Now, part of that was voluntary, and the other part is that those perms have burned up and messed their hair up a lot. They're having to go natural now. And the other thing is that wearing those tight braids on the side of their head has pulled out spots around their hair. Some of them, the hairline's starting back there, you know, because of the braids being so tight. We're not in the African sun. It's not creating the same type of oils on our scalp as here in the hills of North America, where you have four different seasons and terrible weather. And so that hasn't worked on our hair, even though, you know, uh, and some of that hair is made from raccoons, horses, hyenas. It's made from anything, and they put it together, ship it over here, and sell it to us. I was getting a doll for one of my daughters. There was a white mother and a white girl, little girl, in the doll section. And the mother said, you can have any doll you want. I saw, you know, I just watched the little girl. She was walking around, and I was looking at dolls, too, and I was looking to see which one. And all of a sudden, the little girl took a brown doll, a black doll. And the mother said to her, why do you want that doll? She said, because it's pretty. She said, no, it ain't pretty. And not only that, it don't look like you. That's what a white mother told a white child. It don't look like you, and it's not a pretty doll. What happens to the black child? When that young white girl meets that black child, what's been ingrained in that little girl's head? See, the adults are the problem. We have more power as black women than we will ever understand that we have. And so they come to the people with the power when they want to control a group or a nationality. Teach a child that you are beautiful. I had a little girl say to me, my nose is too big. I said, well, can you breathe? She said, yeah, I can breathe. I said, well, your nose is just right. When they make baby food, they really make it for the mother because the mother's not going to give the baby nothing that she don't like. So the baby ain't never had sugar and salt, pepper, and chemicals. <laughs> so the baby is sitting in your lap, and you feeding it, and they see that white baby on there. You don't see it. They see it. And every time she puts in there a good feeling run through their body, now they got tests that you can flash a white child and a good feeling to run through your back even after you've grown. Slave mistress, she didn't allow black women to nurse her baby because she didn't produce milk, because nature will produce milk in a woman's breast if she has a child. So they had their own breast milk, but it was not the same nutrients as that black breast milk. And that's why they put their babies to our breasts, so that we 
could give them all the nutrients and put all of those vitamins and everything into that child that they needed so it would grow up strong and healthy like our babies were. There's a case called the Buck versus Bell case that makes it perfectly legal for the government to sterilize a person without their consent. And they can sterilize people they deem as undesirables. And that case has never been overturned. That case came from 1927. And right now, a lot of African American women are being sterilized in prison. A lot of African American women are being sterilized with birth control. So a lot of people don't realize that this sterilization process is real and is perfectly legal in a lot of cases. And they're not only coming after us for birth control and get us to, to uh, sterilize ourselves so we can't produce, they're coming after us for our stem cells because this is what the white scientific industry is using now in order to come up with all of these new technologies and discoveries about how to save their lives, how to be youthful, how to do heart repair without surgery and all of that. All of that comes from stem cells, hysterectomies of the 70s and 80s. See, that was the way to sterilize black women then. Oh, every other black woman you met had had a hysterectomy. Okay, just take all of the organs out and don't have to deal with it. When I say slavery is to you in America, what, did, what do you, mentally, what do you see? You see black men and women with things on their neck, you know, chains and on their feet so they can't run away, you know? That's what you see. Uh, you don't see that on children. Children are gonna follow their parents. You see children running free, following behind their parents. The 1700s, there was an act called the Casual Killing Act in Virginia. And what this was, was a law that said that if you killed someone black as a result of correcting them, but it would not be considered a felony, but anyone accused, so giving that, a, that punishment would be basically free of any punishment or any, um, wrong do or any wrongdoing, called the Casual Killing Act. Stay with me. That means you are killing, beating people to death, essentially. What we're talking about here is folks that were beating people to death to such a degree that you had to create a law to protect you from it. Now then, of course, if one looks closely, we go, who then was, were they trying to protect that, were, that was beating someone to death so frequently that you needed a law to protect them? And that would be white women who were beating black children to death because, well, whose children were they really? There's the case down in South Carolina where um, the police had rounded up this woman's husband. She went down to the jail talking about, you know my man didn't do this. You let him go. Well, she didn't know her place. She was eight months pregnant. She didn't know her place. The lynch mob took her, stripped her naked, strung her up, they notice as she's gagging because, you know, she's, they're hanging her, is that her stomach, because she's naked, is quivering. So they get a knife and they slice her belly open. The eight-month baby comes out and they stomp on the baby's head. Nothing happens. The youngest person electrocuted in this country to receive capital punishment by the government was a young African-American 14-year-old boy named George Stinney, and he was falsely accused of killing two white girls. Recently, the government is trying to issue a pardon for him, and that's what they do a lot of times. When we suffer injustice, they'll wait 50 or 60 years in order to give a pardon or to um, try to right the wrong after the fact. I think they'll try to probably do that with Trayvon Martin 40 years from now. That was sad what happened to Trayvon Martin and I felt so badly for his parents. Nobody wants to outlive their children, okay? But do you hear his name anymore? Very rare. And one of the other reasons is that they started a Trayvon Martin Foundation. Well, blacks ain't got no foundations unless they're supported by white money, okay? And part of the agreement for the foundation is that no more of that race stuff. We're going to work for the humanity of man. We're going to work so we can all get along and in unity or something. You know, all of us are the same. And that's the nonsense you go. And so his parents had to pull back on that talk they were talking at first. So about four or five black police officers, big guys, I'll never forget because I looked up and they like had muscles on top of muscles. These are some big brothers. And they showed up and um, I'm assuming they want a book or something. And this guy has a stack of eight by 10 glossy pictures and he hands them to me, but they slide and they're all lynchings. And I didn't look at them at first. I'm going, well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm really familiar with lynchings, done a lot of research. He goes, no, no, you're not familiar with these. 
So I look at them in their contemporary lynchings. He says, they're telling us these are suicides. And you're seeing all these different bodies of black, all black males. He worked in a drugstore and he sent uh, a white girl that he worked with a Christmas card. Her father clocked. Her father got the lynch mob together. They grabbed that 14-year-old boy, and they grabbed the boy's father. They went out to the bridge. They beat the crap out of that boy. They tied his hands. They bound his feet. They yanked the father's head to force the father to watch as they threw the boy into the water, alive with his hands bound and feet bound, to watch his son drown. If a white group of boys do something, they'll say, four white teens broke into a store downtown. If a black group of boys do it, four black men broke into this place and did this and did that. They use a different language for what they give their children and what they give ours. If the black boys do something, they put their faces right up on the camera. I don't care how old they are. That's where the new ruling came from about trying as an adult. That was against you. Okay, and then if a white boy do something, they uh, put a, a screen over their face or they'll show the back of his head. And I say if a person just turns on the television, you put a child in front of the television for six months, they will learn racism, white supremacy, because they're seeing white, 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 white. There may be a black image, hopefully one that's constructive, but many times not. So the culture is teaching itself 24-7, as all cultures do. If you look at what happens in our schools as it relates to institutional uh, white supremacy, you still see the child being impacted horrifically, horrifically, by the miseducation of the child and their minds. My argument is psychologically that when you have a young woman of European descent, 23 years of age, in a classroom, of children that are in the seventh grade, 12, 13, 14, there's going to be very serious social problems in that classroom. Many times when a young African American may act out in class, that teacher takes it personal and believes that he is attempting to cause physical harm to her. A sister in the class, at least, not all sisters, but I know a lot of sisters, something going on, she said, hey, Kwame, sit down, man, stop. She, she doesn't take it personal because she probably has a little Kwame at home. That she sees him as a young man that's just doing his thing. The teacher said that he was making sexual advances towards her. He was 10, first of all. That's not a good thing to go in. You know what he did? He flipped at a bird. <laughs> I said, no, 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 he wasn't suggesting sexual intercourse with you. He was telling you where to go and how far. But you see, again, that's where she went because she sexualizes all, all black males. That's what her dad probably told her about black males, even at 10, who doesn't even have any legitimate amount of testosterone to even be thinking about her. But still, you know, again, but those are, that's what's been told. All black men are trying to rape white women, right? When in fact, the opposite was true. We have this statistically. We know who was being raped. There wasn't white women. But that's, isn't that what's out there? Body parts, they've been selling body parts. This is, that's old, that's not new. That's why black people don't like to go to hospitals. They go to get their toes clipped, their fingernails clipped, and they wake up and their foot's gone. They've been utilizing the organs of black people for years, the organs and the, the body parts and the members of African-American people, and that goes back to George Washington. There's a long-time myth that George Washington had wooden teeth. We've, we've heard that myth growing up in school. The reality is George Washington did not have wooden teeth because common sense will tell you you can't put wood in your mouth, it gets wet, and wet wood is useless. What George Washington did, he had the teeth of his African slaves yanked out of their mouths, and he made dentures out of these teeth. And they're on display. His dentures are on display at museums right now. And that just goes to show the history of African people having our bodies mutilated and our members disfigured and mutilated for the betterment and benefit of the dominant society. 
In America, at least, at least 2,500 black people go missing every year. At least. Never to be found again, not killed enough. You just don't find them again. Why doesn't that number ever go down? How can you constantly have the same amount of people? Are you trying to say the same killers go out and murder the same amount of people every year? No. Somebody is taking black people off the street. There's been stories on this. Kidnapped by the government. Kidnapped by organ traffickers. Drive-by shooting is organ stealing. I'm worth $50 million and I need a kidney. And you know, kidneys are pretty sensitive. You gotta find somebody who really got the kidney that matches yours. You think I'm gonna wait till somebody die for me to get one? If I don't get one soon, I'ma die. So guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pay somebody to go research people. Okay, let's go look at all the black organ donors. Let's look at all the black people who got organ donor on their driver's license, which is why I'm not a friend of that. I say, if you wanna donate your organs, put it in your will. Say that if I die, this could go to my family, my relatives, my friends, or whomever. But when you put it on your license, I believe you make yourself a public target. And so what did they find? We got a guy in Los Angeles. He has the same blood type as you, same kidney type as you likely. He ain't he healthy though, he ain't likely to die no time soon. He don't know you, so he ain't gonna give you no organ for free. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna arrange a murder that makes it look like he was in a car accident. We're gonna arrange a murder that makes it look like he committed suicide. So the next thing you know, you coming out the gas station, boom, you get hit by a Mack truck, you dead, gone. You get taken to the funeral home, your family come to the funeral, they don't know that before your body got laid to rest. A little hole was poked and they pulled your kidney out. A lot of people don't know, when you get arrested or even when you get convicted, a lot of times law enforcement or police will swab your mouth for DNA. And now they have your DNA record on file, they have your genetic information on file. And you have to understand with law enforcement, a lot of times they'll sell your information to tabloids and like especially celebrities, they sell their information to tabloids and magazines and news outlets all the time. So it's not a stretch to believe that they won't use your DNA or your genetic information for nefarious reasons. You my son, cops come by and inform me you just been shot dead. You don't have jurisdiction over that body. Mm -hmm. That's the coroner. You can't get that body till the coroner release you. So we get released, we go down and pick it up, and I see all these cuts and these stitches. I just thought they was doing a read to an investigation, following the family, and they took your organs. Mm -hmm. I'm under all this stress, my son is dead. Now you buried now, I can't dig you up because the court got to have permission. Most of those cases is organ stealing. It's been known for a long time, even back in slavery times, that black organs were considered superior genetically to other folks' organs. For example, whenever there's a transplant, okay, especially when rich folks get heart transplant, liver transplant, kidney transplant, they like white, they like black organs. We had a famous case in Pennsylvania, Governor Casey who was one of the most racist governors who ever lived back in the 19, late 80s, early 90s. He had a heart transplant. Guess who heart they gave him? A black person's heart. Down in Georgia, there was a case of an African-American 17-year-old kid who was found mysteriously dead at school. He died in the gym, they did an autopsy, and they buried him. His family, they weren't satisfied with the results because they, they still wanted to know what happened to their son. They had the body exhumed, found out that his organs were missing and his body was stuffed with newspapers and people are still trying to find answers. The officials down there in Georgia, they act like they don't know what's going on. There was another case out here in California. A young African-American man was found dead in Death Valley in the, in, the, in the desert. All of his organs were missing. His liver, heart, lungs, kidneys, all gone. There's a case in, in the UK recently. A Somalian girl was brought over there for organ harvesting. They found out that they were gonna harvest her organs and they stopped that. There was another case in Asian couples. They went over to Africa. They adopted a black girl, two weeks later she was dead. So these cases of organ harvesting are just going on all over the world and people are being real quiet about it. The Rodney King riots. <laughs> the cops arrested 18,213 black folks. They couldn't have come for 10,000 of them. That's what happened in New Orleans. Remember when you saw those helicopters? They were picking up all them black babies and taking them up in the helicopter. And my husband and I sit down and said, we wouldn't have sent our son with them. I don't care who they was. We'd all died in the water together. We wouldn't have sent our baby up there. And they never got a bunch of those children back, as we all know. Organ harvesting in Africa, it's a business. 
In fact, they've set up so many sophisticated places around the so-called third world where there are nations like France, England, New Zealand, Israel. All these places now are looking in the impoverished areas because in, mostly in these impoverished areas like Brazil, uh, places in South Africa, uh, right here on this continent, wherever there's poverty, there's crime. And wherever there's crime, you know there's a lot of deaths and there's a lot of shooting. They are killing black people for their organs. Think about it. Organs are the only commodity that people must have to live that you cannot buy in a store. So if I am sick and I need a heart, I can't buy that. And we know all the problems with the fake hearts, that they can give a pacemaker to a bad heart. But what about when the heart needs to be replaced? You gotta find a match and it ain't none on the donor list and I'm worth $50 million and I could care less about black people anyway. Guess what? Somebody gonna get shot in a drive-by. Switch over to Haiti. Uh, Jean Belrive, at the time, he was the prime minister at the time when Katie was hit with that earthquake that killed over 130,000 uh, brothers and sisters down there in that island. They had a report on CNN with Jean Belrive, and he said specifically that there was organ harvesting and child kidnapping going on. And we have already reports of a lot of trafficking, even of organ trafficking. Of organ trafficking? Yeah. Now? Now, already. Of the victims of the earthquake? Yeah. So, Do you know that for sure? Yeah, I know that for sure, and it was discussed in Montreal during the conference. If you live in Los Angeles and you want to adopt a black child, why not get one from Los Angeles? You have every age, every skin color, every hair type, whatever you want, it's here, because black kids are not being adopted by black people. But instead, you want to go all the way to Ethiopia and get one. You want to go all the way to Haiti and get one after the earthquake. You want to go all the way to the Middle East and get one. And East Africa and a Middle Eastern country, I believe, are the two top countries for international adoption. Why? Because they have poor supervision and tracking processes. Once you get a baby from Ethiopia, and as we know, Ethiopia is one of the poorest countries on the continent. Once you get a baby from Ethiopia and bring them back to America, the Ethiopian government and their adoption agencies really don't have the technology or the resources to follow up and see what you're doing with that child. In fact, I've read articles on it where they say that after about six months, we never hear from the child again or the person who adopted them. They'll take their children, let them because they're desperate for money and sell them to a white family as a maid. They don't know that the husband gonna be in there raping the child, boy or girl. They don't know that that child may have to sleep out in the garbage, eat garbage. They don't know really how it's going to be when they get us alone and there's no help coming and no sanctuary for us. If I want to create a domestic slave, domestic slavery, what better way than to get a child from Haiti who's dying to leave Haiti because they've been poor their whole life and now they're nine years old, bring them to America and after all, I'm a Hollywood superstar, okay? They see me on TV every night. I got a mansion with three swimming pools. They've never seen nothing like that in Haiti. And then I tell them, you don't even have to go to school. All you have to do is stay here and do what I tell you to do. We need you to clean this, fold that, buy this, run these errands. They are adopting black children and turning them into domestic house slaves for rich white people. And they will never get in trouble because the black children see this change of life as a blessing. I'm not going to tell. They don't make me go to school, but look how I live. I live great. Yeah, I'm a slave and I don't get paid, but look how I live. I'm living great. There's a movie that came out a couple of years ago, and you can watch this movie on Netflix. There's a movie called I Am Slave. It's the true story about an African girl who was kidnapped and she was brought over to Europe, forced to work as a domestic, and she actually escaped to tell her story. And this is very common that's going on right now, and a lot of people don't know about it. As a matter of fact, a lot of times when you go to places like New York and you see a lot of domestic workers walking around with these white children, you just naturally think they're regular nannies that they hired. But a lot of these women are African immigrants or Haitian immigrants or Caribbean immigrant women who are undocumented, they're brought over, and they're made to work for little or no money. So this modern type of slavery definitely goes on right now. Find themselves at a school meeting. Black mother seated next to the white mother. 
son seated on either side of them. Black mother leans over to the white mother and goes, oh, by the way, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed your son is doing really well. And the white mother goes, well, thank you so much. He really is. He's quite the man. He's in the TAG program. Did I mention that? He also won the science fair last week. His uncle's an astronaut. The boy's brilliant. She's thrilled to death, oozing with pride for this black mother commenting and complimenting her son. Then the white mother sits back, and before she can sit back fully, she realizes that the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. So she stops and she goes, wait a minute, you're talking about my son? Your son's the one that's really coming along? Well, that boy's really, oh my goodness, he's doing well. Black mother's response, girl, get out of here. Gee, you do, yeah, that boy's something else. So, oh, he's, he's a handful. Girl, get out of town. Now, the behavior is common. It's common across class. But why is she doing it, right? Now, the truth is, the secret is everybody black knows that even though she's going, girl, get out, quit talking, but that boy's a knucklehead. She's really proud. Throw that whole scene back that you have a white slave owner come through, male or female, see a black mother maybe with her children in, in the fields or a black father with the children in the big house, whatever, and that white person says to the black person, why, is that your boy? Ah, that boy's sure coming along. <laughs> What are you going to say to him? Uh, well, no, no, so he's stupid, he's shiftless, because I don't want you to sell him. If it's my daughter, I don't want you to breed her. Appropriate adaptation of living in a hostile environment. We never unlearned that. Never did. put into slavery, we were beat into submission, and the person that we looked up to was the slave master. So what you have to understand, a lot of black people in America look at themselves through the eyes of the slave master. We feel the same way that they feel about us. We want the same thing. There have always been laws that would pit African-American people against other African-American people. During slavery, they had a law called the Meritorious Manumission Law, where African people would get rewarded for turning in another African slave or turning in a person who wanted to create some type of um, rebellion or, or runaway slave. So there were all types of incentives to give African American people for turning on each other. I mean, all of our major organizations are supported by people who classify themselves as white. So it becomes difficult to bite the hand that feeds you. Give the illusion of inclusion. And under the illusion of inclusion, we're actually going to take them back to Jim Crow. That's what they're doing. They're taking us back as they give us the propaganda of going forward, and they do this through the hoop. Black bourgeoisie. Every city got a black bourgeoisie. This is how white supremacy operates. A numerical minority cannot control a numerical majority without participation from the majority. It's impossible. A lot of black secret societies are secret to the black community because you're not secret to the dominant society because if you're a black secret society or a black organization, either you're going to be funded by the dominant society or you're going to be infiltrated by the dominant society. So a lot of these black organizations are secret to black people. If you look at most uber rich black people, I'm not talking about the rappers because, I mean, that's not moving the financial scope. But I'm talking about the black people that really are making money, especially the men. You don't see anything cultural about them. You usually don't see no beard. You usually don't see no long hair. They're not threatening at all. You never see them stand for anything. And a few of them may stand when all of the black people are standing so they won't look bad. Like they'll jump on a Trayvon bandwagon, bandwagon and throw a hoodie on and, you know, take a pose for the camera, they're not really going to move the pose. And that's what I keep telling people. You know, a lot of black people who are doing very well for themselves, who benefited off the system being the way that it is, why would they change? A lot of the black secret societies, they were started because many of the people were the mulatto offspring of slave masters. As a matter of fact, in South Carolina, there was a group called the Brown Fellowship Society, and they were basically freed Africans who were the offspring of the slave masters, and they didn't want to identify themselves with black. 
and they couldn't be accepted by the dominant society, so they called themselves Brown. They settled on that. And there was a major uprising that was going to happen in South Carolina, the Denmark Vesey Resurrection. And there were members of this organization called the Brown Fellowship Society that told on the Denmark Vesey rebellion leaders. Money is an anesthetic. It kind of dulled the pain a little bit. You know, you, oh, well, maybe I can make it. Well, it ain't so bad. You know? Well, there's some good ones out there. I mean, you know, we come up with a whole new scenario of rap to talk about once we get really, really big, big successful. Flat and impoverished, it is the last place on earth to look for the extraordinary or for the shadow of greatness. For generations, black people have been economically disenfranchised by different laws, different types of public policies. So because there is economic deprivation, it's very easy to find black people who need the money and who are willing to throw other black people under the bus for money. So this is why it's important for African-American people or us in general to have rules and integrity when we're trying to get our paper. Because like they say, man, all money is not good money. There's a, tons of millionaire rap artists alone. 20 years ago, there was no record deals. There was no shows for just anybody. Now everybody's touching some money. So why, what rules? The rules is go get money. So they, all the rules went out the way. All the rules were forgotten. You know what I'm saying? And, and what happens is dudes get lost because they never had to follow no rules. They never looked up to anybody that was a stand-up person. So it's all about paper, paper, paper. There is no rules. So what happens is they wind up one day, I, don't, I got a little money and I don't know why I don't have no real respect because they forgot to look at the examples before them. What did a promotion mean for black folks? Let's just take a look at what promotions meant. Okay, if you're promoted as a woman, uh, the likelihood is you are either going to be breeder Right, you're gonna end up having getting bred or passed around as a favor, right? So th there's fear around, inherent fear around being promoted. If you're a man, you get promoted into what? An overseer? So then you get promoted into being my oppressor. So I'm not all that interested in you getting promoted. Or maybe, you know, you get, you get promoted into being a stud, right? You get promoted into, here's another one, being a preacher. Interesting, all the things that happen around that. At one time, the churches used to be a place that was some power for us and where we could go and have certain discussions or mobilize and things. Well, faith-based money that Bush came up with eliminated that because once the churches applied for and got that money, they couldn't say nothing else about racism no more. That in that, they bought them out. There was another organization called the Blue Vein Society down in New Orleans, and they were called the Blue Vein Society because they were mulatto um, black people who would only let other light-skinned black people in the organization. The rule was you had to be light enough so they could see your blue veins. That's why they call themselves the Blue Vein Society. Even now, and until recently, a lot of so-called black organizations, they've had this brown paper bag test. You had to be a certain skin tone in order to be accepted. So there are a lot of these black secret societies that take on a lot of the negative viewpoints of the dominant society or that the dominant society have of other black folk. We know that the first full-time FBI agent in American history, black agent, was actually hired to infiltrate the Marcus Garvey movement, working under the supervision of J. Edgar Hoover to destabilize it. African American people are the only people who are rewarded for turning on other African American people. You don't see that with other people in the dominant society. You don't see Latino people being rewarded for turning on other Latino people. You don't see Asian people being rewarded for turning on other Asian
Dehumanization. No other slave in world history was dehumanized. Prevented from identifying as a human being. Nobody else. We are the only people in world history who have ever been dehumanized. Number two, your inability to learn was codified as a federal crime. Nowhere in history were slaves not allowed to learn, ever. You could be killed reading a book. You have never seen that in world history. And number three, it's the only oppression where the whole world benefited. Everybody benefited from the enslavement of African people and nobody did nothing about it. That makes your predicament different. So no matter how much we want to join ranks with the Latinos and the Asians and the Arabs, you have nothing in common with them. In fact, you need to be careful because just like with the civil rights movement, they will use you again for your numerical strength and then abandon you at your time of need. They're always trying to find a comparative form of slavery coming out of Africa, and the slavery there, the servitude there, was much different than European servitude. There's a book by an, an African gentleman. This was the first time an African who was captured in Africa and brought over to the New World, this was the first time he got to tell his story from his own perspective. A guy named Oluda Aguiano had a book that was a bestseller in the 1700s, and he talked about the difference of being enslaved in Africa and being in servitude in Africa and Europe. He talked about when he was in servitude in Africa, the people, the Africans who had him in servitude, they treated him like an extended family member. They treated him with a, for a certain level of humanity and dignity. And he said once he got to the European slave ships, their slavery was something totally different. He'd never been beaten before. They were beaten on. People were getting raped on the ship. So he specifically stated how barbaric the European slavery was as compared to the African servitude. We have people today who deny that the history itself is even relevant to who we are as a nation of people and to what America represents in the world. There's no America without slavery. There is no economic dominance. There is no greatest American century without the capital produced by the work of black people in this nation. Point of fact. A lot of historians now will try to make it seem like slavery was just this stain on the fabric of America. But in reality, slavery was the fabric of America. Cotton was king. Slavery was the number one game in town. Let's not get it twisted. A kind of special kind of slavery we enacted in America had never been enacted before. And that is to say that not only are you my slave, but your children will be my slave. And your children's 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 will be my slave. In fact, you will never get out of slavery, regardless of how many generations of your unquote family is born in this place that was new and different. Many of the African leaders over in Africa, when they found out what was really happening to enslaved African people, when they found out that they were being taken from Africa and not being brought back, when they found out how inhumane many of the Africans were being treated, many of the African leaders fought the Europeans back, and that's a story that they never like to talk about. One person in particular was a queen, Madame Tenabu, who was a leader in the area we now know as Nigeria. When she found out what they were doing to the Africans, she fought vehemently against the British. So you get this really interesting interesting history, this really interesting narrative that the conservatives tell that basically says Rosa sat down, Martin stood up, he had a dream and we all overcame. And so therefore, since the signs of Jim Crow came down, obviously racism does not exist. Obviously, therefore, this is the land of equal opportunity. Obviously, therefore, when I'm looking at a 40% unemployment rate in the land of opportunity where racism does not exist then this is because th these folks are fundamentally structurally flawed. I told a white woman this one time and she broke down crying. I said, are you benefiting off of what your great grandparents did? She said, yes. I said, you know what they did to get that, right? She said, yes. I said, are you ashamed of that? She said, yes. I said, but don't you still benefit off of it? She said, yes. Are you willing to give it back? No. So what does that make you? You know, the damage has been done. Everyone who has, from the 
the levels of what we talk Caucasian, Nordic, and so forth. No matter what ethnicity they may come from, they can always shave, they can always put on different clothes, and the skin can give them a pass. They could even change their names. But we are immediately identified. There's no way for us to hide who we are. So what have we had to do? We've had to adapt. We've had to even adopt. Or the civil rights struggle, Latinos and Mexicans deliberately stayed out of the civil rights movement. They waited on the sidelines until the benefits of the bill was reaped and then they came out not claiming they were black, but were minority. In fact, one of the reasons the word minority was introduced into the political jargon was to effectively describe people of African descent who didn't want to be African. So minority was a catch-all that allowed people to still get the benefits of being a person of color, but not having to identify with African people. That's like Hispanics. You see, some Hispanics, many Hispanics have brown skin, but they will put on the census white. And if you ask them, why did they put down white? And they'll say, because white is where the power is. You see, African-American people are in a very unique position in this country. Other people are immigrants. This is why they're trying to teach in textbooks today. I just got a, a message the other day where they're trying to teach that African people brought to America during enslavement are being called involuntary immigrants. Because once you get that word immigrant in, then you lose the flavor of the fact that we are a nation within a nation that is sovereign. The thing is, people try to say, well, other groups of people were mistreated like African Americans, but that's not true because other groups of people, you couldn't mistreat them because they had a home country to protect them. You couldn't mistreat certain Asian groups of people because they had a home country that would protect them. As a matter of fact, there were some Italian immigrants who were lynched in the late 1800s. Italy almost went to war with the United States based on that, and the United States had to apologize to Italy because of the way they were treating the immigrants. In the late 1890s, I think it was, um, in New Orleans, some Italian sailors were, they thought they did something, and these Italian sailors were lynched. The U.S. government apologized profusely to the Italian government for lynching these Italian citizens, and I believe paid compensation to the victims' families. Oh, we are so sorry. Now, you take that, so at a certain level, you know this mess is wrong. I think as African people, we need to know the difference among an ally, a friend, and an enemy. Because many times, we align ourselves with people. World War II, the United States aligned themselves with China and with Russia, and fought Germany and Japan. After World War II, Germany and Japan became our friends and Russia and China became our enemies. But to get the job done, we aligned ourselves with people who became our enemy after the job was done, and those who we fought who are our enemies became our friends after the job was done. African folk don't know that your ally can become your worst enemy after the deed is done. Allies are not friends. We need to know the difference. Black business people were forced out of their businesses, had their businesses taken from them, um, not allowed to even have a business to begin with. That fight is extremely hard. That fight is so hard, it's exhausting. In terms of racial violence, both in the South and the North, the most common instances of racial violence before we get to really the mid 20th century where we see a lot more police activity as the site for urban rebellions and, and clashes, racial clashes on the streets, was enterprising, economically successful black folks on the move. Those were the ones who were most likely to face the threat 
of racial violence or be victims of it because it was exactly their success that posed the ultimate threat to uh, white supremacy. When that white skin, you have the complexion for the protection for the collection. One of the, the things with lynching is that when black folks don't know their place, it means black folks are prosperous. Black folks aren't supposed to be prosperous. If you're prosperous, I mean, this is what, you know, Ida B. Wells, when they lynched her friend who ran that successful grocery store in, in Memphis. How can you be a successful businessman? How can you be more successful than me? And by the way, at the time of his death, Marcus Garvey was planning a black bank because he knew if we were going to have an economic insurrection, we're going to have to be able to give black people the wealth they need to start their businesses. During Reconstruction, they had something called the Freedmen's Bank, and a lot of African-American people would put their earnings and their savings in this bank, and what happened is that the Freedmen's Bank just took everybody's money in many cases. They took a lot of African-American people's money, and a lot of people were homeless and destitute, so a lot of African-American people got into the habit of just spending their money very quickly when they got it in order to buy something tangible, something that couldn't be taken away from them, like their money. So unfortunately, we have the habit of buying stuff that has no appreciating value just so our cash money won't be taken away. Well, that's the only place we show our distrust of white people. We don't trust them with our money, not cash money. Now, we trust them to buy things and that it'll work or operate or function, whatever we buy from them for material things. But we still don't trust them with our money, and that's been historical. That money was under the bed, under the mattress, in the wall, out in the shed. But we don't trust them with our money because we know that they have stolen from us, but we don't understand that money is not the only thing they steal. Just because you're a rich athlete, you didn't forget the treatment. You didn't forget the oppression. So you're gonna live now. You want to do it up now. Your woman wants diamonds, Birkin bags, Bentleys. She gonna have it. You want Marcielago, $14 million house, fly private, eat at the best restaurants, wear the best clothes. You're gonna have it. It feels like it's fleeting, the money. It feels like someone's gonna come and steal your life in the night because they don't want you to have it because you're black. There was a brother down in Miami named Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Now, Yahweh Ben Yahweh had a religious organization, and he did a lot of stuff in the community down in Miami. And quietly, this brother earned and amassed almost a billion dollars worth of assets. He had hotels, he had restaurants, he had all types of businesses, apartment complexes. And the government trumped up some charges on this brother and they put him in prison and they took away a lot of his assets. And he was in a position where he was vulnerable and that's the problem. A lot of us, when we figure out a way to get our own money or stack up our own money without the help of the dominant society and we're by ourselves, we become very vulnerable. So it's very important that we have a protection mechanism in order. I don't blame nobody for doing what they're doing. They are business people. And if we're willing to spend our money with them, they have every right to sell their products to us. It's us that got to make the decision that we're gonna look to black beauty supply stores, that we're gonna start to go to our own restaurants. Nobody's forcing us to go there. We're doing this freely. Everybody going in that store. Every nationality people going in that store. Well, when a black person opened a business, it's not gonna be like that. And we got to try to convince the black people to go in there. That's some kind of self-hatred. Remember, the white people's ice is colder. Integration in America basically means that black people get to spend their money with the dominant society. Because we have to be very honest, black people don't live around non-black people in large numbers. Black people don't go to school with a lot of people in the dominant society. So black people are only allowed to spend their money with those in the dominant society, and a lot of black people feel equal when they do that. All of these entertainers, they talk about all the power that they have. You know, they're doing commercials for smartphones and water and all of these different things. If you want to see true power, then you create something and you make that hot. You support somebody black and make that hot. Even in shopping, white people tend to brag about how cheaply they purchased something, what a deal they got. We brag about how much it costs because we want to demonstrate. And one of the tricks that white people used to do on us in a lot of department stores was to pull out something and say, oh no, you can't afford that one. I won't show you that one. We immediately gonna buy that because we are just not going to be classified as a person who can't afford something that they sell. 
Oprah Winfrey has all the money in the world, but she still became marginalized. Recently, she was in somewhere in Europe and she tried to buy a purse and they wouldn't allow her to buy a purse because I don't think they recognize who she was. But a lot of times when we are, again, isolated, we're still vulnerable because our money does not trump racism, white supremacy. Oprah didn't try to buy no purse. Oprah tried to steal that woman's purse. That's what, that was, was the problem. They kept that on the down low. With her fat butt running down the street with a purse. Because they know even if they kill our children, we're going to buy Louis Vuitton and Gucci anyway. We don't farm no more, for the most part. So they control the food. They're doing this under a black president, shutting down public schools like there's no tomorrow. Chicago, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, everywhere you go, getting rid of public schools. And why? Because black people are no longer needed in order for the American economic order to function. We were brought here to serve as a catalyst in an industrial revolution, an economic cartel. Well, the immigration bill that's being championed now is all about doing what? Replacing blacks in the labor force. That's all it's about. The immigration bill does not include most African countries. The immigration bill does not deal with Haiti and other jet black Caribbean islands. The immigration bill is about Latinos and Mexicans and helping them to replace Africans in the workforce, to totally remove America's dependency on the black laborer, something the government has been working on since 1865 in the 13th Amendment. Get a good education and get a good job. That's what my parents actually said to me. Why? Because when they were coming up in the early 1900s, they couldn't get a good education and get a good job in America. So that's what they wanted for their children. But that's not what I've taught my two sons. I've taught my two sons to get a good education and to create a job. We think that if we shop too much with you, then you have more than me. That's back to that greed and selfish and envy and jealousy that we have for each other, that we were taught to have for each other, okay? And so we'll turn traitor real quick. In many cases, if you're an African-American person and you're isolated and you still make a lot of money because you're isolated, you're still going to be vulnerable. So a lot of times when you move and shake around people in the dominant society and you're vulnerable and you're isolated, they'll still try to play you a certain way. They'll still try to put you in a certain bag. They'll still try to marginalize you, even though you are at the same level as them financially. You know, I got onto a yacht one time and um, Tommy Hilfiger was there. We was out in Cairns. And Tommy, I met before, a cool guy, was like, hey, man, what's up, Nas? You gonna rap for us? And I was like, I was like, man, I was like, nigga. It goes against the nature of European democracy for African people to be successful. And when there is success, there will be repercussions to those who may not be able to defend themselves as the ones who are having success. And it's important that we as a people understand this and protect our, our people from this concept. Europeans do not share power with African people. That's rule number one of white supremacy. That's why you do not see multinational corporations that are co-owned equally by Europeans and Africans. It don't happen. Michael Jackson was one of the few African-American people who slipped through the cracks. Michael Jackson manipulated the game and he got into a position where he did a deal with the Japanese and ended up owning half of the publishing of most of the music artists in the country, or in the world for that matter. And because the dominant society does not like to share power with African people, he became a target because he was in a position by himself and he became vulnerable. And we see what happened to him. Black people had access to wealth. Let's go to capitalism. Because in order for capitalism to work, you got to have what? A large pool of unemployed people. If you ain't got broke people, you don't get rich. That's how capitalism works. It exploits the poor. If half the black people in America had access to the loans to put their business into play, would there be enough of us to work? You see that problem? You can't have too many people having their own business because now McDonald's and Macy's and everybody else and Ford ain't got people to slave for them. And that's one of the reasons they mass incarcerating black men. We need workers and we can't get them on the street no more. So we're gonna lock y'all up and force y'all to work. America makes money with black people acting the way that they act. When black on black crime rises in these cities, it's the first thing that happens. Police get new guns, 
new cars, grants, all kind of things. It's money behind black people being this way. And that's when they wiped them out. Remember, the Black Panthers didn't get wiped out till that new group come through talking about, we talking about killing cops, we talking about breakfast program. Pow, was over. Our vote is critically important. Make no mistake about that. But if you were to ask any astute politician, regardless of color, but particularly of color, what's more important, your vote or a check? They would tell you in a New York minute, a check would be more important than your vote. In fact, if I can get a check from you, I ultimately can get your vote. Ask Barack Hussein Obama, had he not put together a machine, a platform, to raise a billion dollars, because that's what it took to become president of the United States, we would not be calling him the president of the United States. It takes money. So while we will give the average democratic politician our vote, we don't write checks. And that's where the real power is. People come to America, the Asians, the Arabs, the East Indians, and they say, you people are lazy. You've been here for 500 years, only been here 10. I got a supermarket, I got a strip mall, I got an import-export business. But how did you get it? You have access to capital. You needed money to build that. You needed money to hire the builders. You needed money to buy that shit. Where did you get it? You either came with it or you got it from an American bank. We are kept from accumulating wealth and we are kept from accessing capital because the banks of America are not gonna finance a black economic revolution. Do you know what happens when you come over here as an immigrant? The government got to pay for you. Hmm? When you come over here as a refugee, why do you think the Ethiopians have these shops? We brought them in as refugees because we're trying to prove to the communist world. Okay, and that's why. Why do you think the Indians, 7-Eleven and all that? The Koreans, for the time everything you picked up said made in Korea. But nothing we made did a Korean want, so the government made a deal with them. So we can get some of our money back. So we'll bring you in and loaned you money to open up businesses because you had to pay us the loan back. I'm going to tell you as a black person, you must support black businesses. You ain't crazy. So all things being equal, this is what I would like for black people to understand. Jews do not support Jewish businesses just because they're Jews. That's not true. All things being equal, you as a Jew have the same quality, value, and service as all of your competition. The tiebreaker is, I'm a Jew, you're a Jew. You get the business. That's the tiebreaker. But all other things must be equal. So I could tell you as a black man, you must support more black businesses, but you ain't crazy. And you're not going to spend your hard-earned money if you can't get the same quality, value, and service for your hard-earned dollar any place else, right? So we have to ramp up our game. We have to compete. I ain't never saw a soul food restaurant in Chinatown. And I don't think it's because they don't like soul food. It's just they're not going to patronize someone that is not their own. I don't blame them. Good for you. I appreciate you. I just wish more of us thought like that. Most people don't know how to accept us, even though we made it out, even though we make an art, and they don't know how to accept us in their circles now. So when they say you're going to rap for us, they don't even know if that's, if that's disrespectful sometimes. Steve Jobs, when he died, he had $300 billion in his personal checking account. Did you hear me? And he couldn't make 58. I got an old trifling uncle in Chicago. Stay drunk, can't read, can't write, cuss out everybody, and <laughs> just keep laughing. He 101. Maybe Steve Jobs should have followed him. Most of those stores never worry about scholarships for their children. We are the source of their children's scholarships to school. While we are buying their products and threatening our children, telling them we ain't got the money, their children are going to school on the money that we are giving them. The money.
Montgomery Bus Boycott, led by Dr. King, is probably one of the best examples of how you can use black economic power to bring white supremacy to its knees. When those black people chose not to ride that bus for 381 days, first of all, you gotta have unity. Because today, it would be difficult to get half of black Philadelphia or Los Angeles or Chicago or New York to not get on public transportation. So they had the unit. But for 381 days, nobody black rode the bus. And when you read the stories, it was so compelling because many of them would walk their shoes right off. They said some of the grandmas was walking on bare skin, but they would not betray the struggle. They would carpool, and then they made it a crime to carpool, and they started locking them up with the carpools, and they still didn't ride the bus. But then something started to happen. The bus company wasn't making enough money, so they had to lay off drivers. So now the white people are losing jobs because the black people ain't riding the bus. Hold on now. Most of these black people work downtown in the factories and in the business district. We need them to work, but they can't get to work or get there on time. So now you're destabilizing the economy of Montgomery. You're messing with taxes. You're messing with salaries. You're messing with businesses. You're messing with merchantile affair. So by them not riding, they cripple the employees, the employers, the city, the tax base, and big business. If you really want to impact white people, mess with their money. Mess with their money. Take food out of their mouth. Put them out of business. It's the only thing that will get their attention. What we need to do is start to march away from the stores we're spending our money in. Now that's a march. That I will participate in. My pastor said that we have to take the tattoos off of our brain. It has, the hate for ourselves has literally been etched in our brains. But I love us. I love us and until I die, I will do better about loving my people. I think we devalue intellectualism within our own community. We know the country does. But I think within our own community, we have devalued intellectualism. All of the people who we revere, from Marcus Garvey to Malcolm X to Sojourner Truth to Ida B. Wells, these are journalists, these are debaters, these are public speakers, these are well-read folks. The Black Panther Party started as student groups in Oakland, folks on college campus figuring out what are we gonna do as young people to change our future so we don't end up like domestics, like our parents. So we need to embrace learning again because the truth is when we were most engaged in the study of our own history and culture, we posed the greatest threat to the then current political and economic status quo. We need our children to stop defining themselves by this notion of failure and um, achievement gap and uh, you know all of the words that the buzzwords that somehow you just believe you know like the sky is falling. It's not. We have the ability and are thriving. And our children need to see that and know that and hear that conversation a lot more than what's wrong. Because there's a lot right. <laughs> we need to focus on that. Why would I want to uplift my slaves? They're my slaves. Of course, I'm going to keep them beneath me. I'm going to keep them third, fourth to me. So put together a class for all of us to attend, and we should even teach the kids in the streets this. The kids in the streets need to open bank accounts, need to understand um, taxes, need to understand stocks, need to understand technology, where that's going, being a venture capitalist. There was a time where I would never want to use the word capitalist because most capitalists are evil bastards. You know what I'm saying? Now I can look at myself and I'm going to play the game. I was born into a capitalist world. Guess what? I'm going to get in. 
I'm gonna be a capitalist, <laughs> like a capitalist, whatever you want to call it. I'm coming in. A lot of times, people will try to make black businesses synonymous with minority businesses, and a minority can mean anything. Because of that minority word, we have to go back to being unapologetically African. We are afraid not to blend in. We want to blend in, so we fight as people of color. We want to blend in. We fight as minorities. Nothing wrong with lending moral support to other people's problems. But your experience in America is unlike everybody else's. Every other person of color in this country came here because they wanted to be here. Everybody, you Asian, Arab, Latino, East Indian, Irish, Italian, yes, you were hung. Yes, you were beat. Yes, you were mistreated. But it couldn't have been that bad because you could have left and you did not. Our Jewish brothers and sisters write checks. Our Asian brothers and sisters write checks. Our Arab brothers and sisters write checks. We have to write checks. And that's how you effectively utilize the political system. Write a damn check and see who will answer your call and your email. Or run up to them and say, you know, I voted for you. So did 900,000 other people. Oh, I wrote a check for a thousand dollars. Now you have my attention. Money is the real power, and other groups, other cultural groups, absolutely understand that. Other groups of people, they have their needs met by politicians because they pool their money together and they go to politicians with an agenda. And that's one thing that African American people will not do. We have to pool our money together with an agenda and take it to politicians. Abel Angora got together with a lot of Hispanic business people and they created a fund. They brought like $30 million to President Barack Obama to his campaign, and this is why the president will talk about Hispanic needs. In the gay community, Hollywood had a fundraiser. They brought millions of dollars to Barack Obama's campaign. This is why the president will talk about gay needs and gay agendas. African American people, we can't get our agendas talked about because the thing is, we won't put no money together as a group and bring that agenda to these politicians, and that's the number one thing we need to do. Whenever there's a politician running or trying to get elected, we should form a group pool our money together and come to them with a specific agenda for African-American people, not minorities. All of our religious leaders need to get together, our economic leaders need to get together, and labor, we need to start to hire ourselves. All of these nail techs and manicure thing, right? And I see black women flocking to them, and I don't see black women owning those shops. I don't see black women working in those shops. And so we have to ask ourselves, okay, if this is something you're willing to spend on, Think about what that means in terms of job creation in your own neighborhoods when you're providing this service. We don't have a food corridor, so we need to figure out how can we get import food. Even in the African stores here, they have food that comes in out of Saudi Arabia, Israel, and a lot of places, okay? but not the Negro in America, not the black people here. We don't have a food corridor. We don't have any way to get, they even bring in people, bring in water, they bring in everything. We don't have anything. We're totally dependent on this country. If all the stores close down, we don't have anywhere to go and we don't have a contact with nobody outside of the country to ship us no food. We don't have a food corridor. That's something that we need to start looking into. Yeah, there's a new sneaker store that I'm opening up in Vegas called 12 AM Run. You know, I'm a sneaker head from back in the 80s, you know? And it's something I talked about doing with other rappers even, like, you know, um, yo, you know, we sit down talking. A lot of people will talk about, yo, let's do a song, let's do a song. I'm like, we've done thousands of songs, man. Like, let's do a restaurant. Let's do a sneaker store. If you want to deal with white supremacy, you got to hit them in the pocket. I preach that. Stop going the moral route. You're not going to convince them that racism is bad. They know that. They're not stupid. You have to deal with people where their interests are. And if they're interested in money, you hit them in a pocket and you get what you want. 5% of the people who became millionaires were salespeople. People who sold something. Because in America, two things are going on 24-7. Somebody's buying and somebody's selling. Right now, black people are doing all the buying. I tell them all the time, stop doing all the buying and sell something. I don't care if you bake cookies, put them in a box, 
put a, a label on it and sell it to somebody. If you live on a farm, take the manure, put it in a bag, put your name on it and sell it to somebody. You can become an entree, entree manure, okay? But sell something, stop doing all the damn buying. That's all we do, sell something. So if you wanna beat racism, sell something and build a business. Black people should at least create a parallel economy where they spend their money with the dominant society, but they also spend their money with their own people. They also build infrastructure in the black community, build businesses where they um, interact and do commerce with other black people. So we should create a parallel economy. So it's like a backup economy so that we could um, employ other black people and we can just have our own money circulating where we're not totally dependent on the dominant society. Those, those of us who have been the people, and those of us who are business people. The job of the company that I started phrasing it is to put the business people out of business because you're messing it up for those of us that are trying to do serious business. Now we know the brother or sister that is the business person. That give you a jacked up business card. They, they do hair, they do computer software, uh, and they of course do detailing in your cars. I mean, I'm not sure what they do. They got two phone numbers crossed out, and they don't have a website. Because a lot of African-American people are comfortable, it's best for us to just get an economic base in the African-American community, since our whole thing is spending money with the dominant society, because we're very comfortable, we want to live like the Joneses. Let's just spend our money and create an economic base among each other. But the thing is, if a group of people are dissatisfied, 100%, you will make a 100% change, and you won't even need money, because your spirit will move you and motivate you to make a change. In the history of liberation, there was no money involved. Something in here. Hmm? Go back and look. Look at the black folks in the movement. Huh? That broke them doors down. No money. Hmm? It's in here. War. That's the protective aspect of it. We need to reach out to those forces that can protect us against those who would wish us harm. This was a black man who was in prison in Atlanta. And this young black man, he was in his 20s, said that he was tired of being harassed on the street, you know, being stopped, stopped and frisked. And he just made up his mind, I'm going to do something so that there will be a legitimate reason to stop me. And so just acting on his own, and I'm just going by his report. Uh, he got a gun and went up behind three white men in the business district and killed two and blinded a third. I think those were the facts. So I was a psychiatrist talking to him. This was a court case at a deposition. I was talking about what this young man had said about why he did what he did. And so one of the white attorneys said, are there any other black men who think this way? And I said, I don't know, but as long as you have a system of racism, it could be. And so then his response was, why, why didn't he just rape a white woman? And I was stunned. And I said to him, do you realize what you have just said? I mean, it's almost like I will offer up the woman you can have the woman, but leave me alone. Because America is running out of foreign targets. They got rid of Saddam, who they made. They got rid of bin Laden, who they made. They got rid of uh, Gaddafi, who they also helped to make. And now look, we don't have no more Arab targets. So what are we gonna do? It's time to come back home and focus on our original terrorists, the Negro Revolutionary. The legal system. We need to get all our great lawyers, attorney Alton Maddox, all of those that came out of the Johnny Cochran School, all of the lawyers across the country that are struggling for the rights in the legal system, we need to get them all together. Banks and savings and loans, that's the one thing we need to do right now. We can do it and we should. The second thing, independent African schools. All of this needs to be put in a curriculum and taught. Financial science, they have to be taught. Military science, they have to be taught. Agricultural science, they have to be taught. Diet and nutrition, they have to be taught. The wealthiest black people on the planet, make no mistake about that, 
Uh, I've traveled every place that black people have been dispersed. I've been to South Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, North Africa, all over South America and all over the Caribbean. And there are no black people in the entire world doing better than we are. In fact, we are the beacon of hope for every single person of African descent in the entire world. And we know that too much is given, much is required. I was just in London. They're catching the same hell. I was just in Canada. They're catching the same hell. St. Croix, Bermuda, everywhere I go, it is the same. So why are we not locking hands? Because white supremacy is global. What is the Trilateral Commission? America, Great Britain, Japan. They are global. United Nations, that is global. Council on Foreign Relations, that is global. Black people are not global. You're fighting a global enemy in a global enterprise, but you're not globally organized. People who classify themselves as white, if they're being righteous and courageous, they themselves will attempt to, well, let's really look at it. Let's stop pretending, you see, or talking about dialoguing together, or let's have dinner together, or let's get to know each other. No, we know each other, but let's talk specifically about the problem that we are dealing with. Let's put it on top of the table and try to be courageous because I think uh, people who classify themselves as white don't want to talk about it. And I would even say the majority of black people are fearful of talking about racism because they don't want to upset white people because that can have its repercussions. We need to get rid of them sellouts. We need to get rid of those individuals who are looking out for themselves, who are the political arm of white supremacy. We need to vote smart. We need to put the people in and make them accountable to us for what is happening to us as a community. And if they're not willing to be accountable, then you don't have a job come election day. And we have to begin to show them that we mean this. Why don't we train the leaders to take over after us? Because we don't want to admit that one day we have to get off the soapbox. One day, I won't be in front of the TV. One day, one day, Umar can't do the interviews. One day, I'm not going to be a good speaker. One day, I got to pass this over. But my ego wants it forever. I want to die with my boots on. And that's the problem with most black organizations. We electing people for president of revolutionary groups at 70 and 80 years old. You don't see white people doing that. You don't see Chinese people electing presidents at 80. The eldership is for the wisdom and the training and the nurture, not for black people. Our elders are out front. You mean to tell me you're the only person who can do that? You can't find nobody else younger? We still need our elders. They're the mind. They're the wisdom. But you need the youth because they are the charisma. They are the organizers. They attract the energy. An elder can't do that. But because black men are so castrated in American society, we're not given an opportunity to manifest our manhood the way everyone else is. A white man could brag about his stock. Chinese man could brag about his businesses. The Italian could brag about everything he owns. What do we have to brag about? We ain't allowed to get stock. We ain't allowed to own businesses. We ain't allowed to get our doctorate degrees the way that we want. We ain't allowed that. So whenever we get an opportunity to be a man, to be a president, to be an organizational leader, to be a pastor, I'm never giving this up because I've been waiting my whole life for this job and I like it. And I'm gonna make up for all the years I wasn't allowed to be out front. Introduce me to your five closest friends and that will tell me who you are. As they know and as they go, you go. You know, don't spend major time with minor people. People going nowhere want you to go nowhere with them. People doing nothing want you to do nothing with them. If you wanna change your life, change your relationship. They say our boys don't wanna to go to school. Our boys don't wanna learn. Black boys wanna be educated as much as anyone else. The problem is the treatment they get on the way to getting their education turns them off. They need masculine energy. We need black male teachers and we need black male principals and we need black male psychologists and the world is telling us that black men don't wanna teach. That's a lie. They're not being recruited because public school is the domain of middle-class white women and they do not wanna see us in there because we will not allow them to treat our kids the way that they treat it. I am not speaking about all peoples of European descent or all peoples of African descent. I'm speaking of them as a group because I cannot deal and pull out certain ones. It's like Dr. Edward Scobie, the, the great uh, Caribbean scholar who used to always say, don't tell me nothing about no good white people. 
because good white people act as shields for bad white people. And they will hide behind the shield of the good one to get into you. And then they'll do their devilment once they've arrived at you. I tell people all the time, I hope you're spending as much time raising the friends of your children that you are spending raising your child a lot. Because the pressure on your child from their so-called friends will be far greater than any pressure you will ever be able to put on your child. So your friends are critically important. Why? Because it's God's way of apologizing for your relatives. But I do think that we need to have more independent schools. We need more men to teach our children. We need to be able to turn our boys over to boys' summer camps in the summer with just men there, some brothers that come in there and deal with them. New article just came out in the New York Times called The Stories That Bind Us. Love this article. They created something called the Do You Know Scale. And the Do You Know Scale has to do with um, looking at children who know their stories. Their family. I'm not talking about his, their family. Well, auntie and uncle and pookie, all of us went through. They've shown now that the degree to which children know their stories, good or bad, doesn't matter if it's a story of, of struggle and, and, and tragedy, doesn't matter. But knowing their story will help mediate stress. You can't take no break when you're up against white supremacy. They have never taken a break since the 1400s, and you taking a break. So the problem ain't that we fall short sometimes is that we don't pick up and keep on going and prepare the next generation. A lot of African-American people try to be too inclusive, and there's nothing wrong with being inclusive, but you have to take care of your group first. Other groups of people, they look out for their group first. Instead of us looking out for our group, we try to look out for everybody else, and that doesn't work for us in the long run because we let other groups of people hijack things that are meant for us. Because the thing is, we talk about reparations as African-American people, but if the government said, look, tomorrow we're gonna give African-American people reparations, you know what, we were wrong, we're gonna make everything right, so tomorrow morning, all African-American people show up to get your reparations check. You know what's gonna happen? First thing tomorrow morning, people who look like Justin Timberlake are gonna show up wearing dashikis and kente cloths, talking about assalamu alaikum, I'm 1 16th African-American. And black people will let it happen. So the thing is, we have to take care of our own group first so that all of our benefits won't get hijacked. They love to see us suffer with grace. Oh. Oh, it hurts so bad, my son, but I was going to keep on working anyway. They love it when they see us doing bad, but we come through it and say, oh, I took it, take a licking and keep on ticking. They love that. They just, they, oh, he had a hard time, but he stayed with it. Why should we have to live like that? You know, frogs adapt to the water. They adapt to whatever the temperature is. If it's cold, they adapt. If you take it and they warm up, they adapt. You put it on the stove, they will adapt until they boil, literally. And all you gotta do is tap the ball, and the frog will jump out. Just tap the ball. So what happens to us is we are boiling. Someone needs to tap the ball, that's what I do. I tap the ball, and that's all you need. If you take a people, and in this people, they wanna rise and do great things, and you do everything you can to make them rise and be great, they're great. You take this other people that wanna be great, and you do everything you can to stop them from being great. Yet in spite and despite of your attempts, they still become great. They're great. They're greater. <laughs>